thanks a lot for, for setting aside some time to attend uh, today's free session. So, uh, as Sean mentioned, today we're going to be exploring the topic of blockchain technology. So, some of you may already uh, be aware of the technology, um, and in which case I hope you are able to, to learn something new in the session. Uh, and for those of you who aren't, then you've come to the right place. So this session is really intended to be non-technical, um, where the aim here isn't to get sort of deep into the technical details. Instead, the intent here is really to give you a, a brief understanding of what the technology is, some of the things that it can be used for, um, and also I'm going to give you an idea of sort of where it emerged and how it's evolved since then. Okay, so where do we begin? Now, uh, I'm going to start off by sort of taking you through a, a progression of the technology. We're going to be looking at where it first started to emerge uh, and then following it through to, to sort of where we are now. Uh, and we're going to be following this uh, nice little man here. You might be able to see him in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, and we're going to be following those mountains. Uh, each one of those mountains sort of represents a pivotal moment uh, in the technology, technology's progression. Sorry, I'll get that out of your way there. Okay. So where do we really begin? Now, blockchain begins with something that you may already be familiar with called Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is a type of digital currency. Uh, it was it first started to emerge in 2008, uh, late 2008 that was. It was sort of as we were going into the, the peak of the global financial crisis. So during that time, uh, an anonymous individual or perhaps group of individuals uh, operating under the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto released an online white paper titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Now, what this white paper basically was, was a nine-page instruction manual detailing how to create a completely digital form of currency that would now enable individuals to transact directly with one another without having to rely on intermediaries like banks or clearinghouses. Now, about two months after this white paper first emerged, uh, Bitcoin was actually created, and its source code was made completely available to the public. So Bitcoin, the, the protocol, isn't actually uh, controlled or governed by any uh, single authority. Instead, it's sort of governed by an algorithm and owned by the network, I suppose you could say. But we'll get into that a little bit more later. Okay. Okay, so if we look at the topic of digital currency, um, it's actually surprisingly difficult to implement. Um, much like with any other form of digital data, uh, it's incredibly hard to keep it secure, but it's also incredibly difficult to keep track of. So if you, if you go over the right-hand side of the slide, you can see sort of some of the problems that, that we typically tend to face when we're trying to implement something like a digital currency. So of course, up there, right at the top, is duplication. So if I were to create, for example, a digital form of dollar, what would be to stop me from simply copy and pasting a, a million copies of those digital dollars and going and buying myself a nice house? other than the fact that nobody would accept it, of course. Well, not much. And then, how do we keep it secure? And how do we stop people from being able to see who I've been transacting with and how much I've been sending? How do I, basically, how do I ensure my privacy? And then, of course, ownership. Who, deter who would determine who owns what? So traditionally, uh, up until the invention of Bitcoin, of course. Uh, a lot of these problems, we, we managed to get around them through a process of intermediation. So what we typically relied on were these trusted third-party intermediaries 
like your banks or your, your clearing houses, such as Swift, uh, and even PayPal. And so they would sit in the middle of that transaction and they'd be holding their own ledger. And for those of you not familiar with accounting, a ledger is really just a type of database. And so if we take, for example, two individuals like we have here on the screen, uh, in gray we have Alice, and in the green on the right we have Bob. Now let's say, for example, Alice Oh, sorry, just uh, I'll just turn up the volume. Sorry, everyone, I'm just trying to figure out the volume here. Okay. Now. If we go back to the example of Alice and Bob transacting, now if Alice on the left wanted to send Bob on the right a, send a sum of money, and they both happen to be transacting uh, while well, using the same bank, um, what would happen is Alice would typically submit a, a request uh, to her bank. Uh, now her bank, as I mentioned, would be holding its own copy of the ledger. And that ledger would sort of have all of the different balances of all the various people at the bank. So they'd simply check, well, A, check to see to ensure that Alice has enough to cover the funds that she's trying to send, to deduct that balance, and then add that to uh, Bob's balance and uh, alter the, 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 um, the totals to reflect that. Now, it starts to become a little bit more confusing once you start to add more of these intermediaries into the mix. So for instance, let's say we take the same scenario. So we have Alice and Bob once again. Only this time, the two of them happen to be using different banks. So where it starts to get confusing here is that those two banks, A, are holding completely different copies. They're each holding a different ledger. So they're not holding the same set of transactions, and they may not necessarily want to trust each other. So typically this would involve another intermediary or may even involve several other intermediaries that'll sit in the middle of that. And so if any of you have ever had to do a uh, uh, cross-border transaction, so you've had to send uh, money to a family or a family member, a friend, or perhaps even a, a, a work colleague overseas, you probably would have found that the process is incredibly time consuming. Uh, it'll typically take between two to three days. And if you're particularly unlucky, it may be even four or five. Now, the reason is because because of all these intermediaries in the middle there, when we have Alice trying to send that money through to Bob, what happens is Alice has to make the transaction A to her bank, which then goes and reconciles it on their ledger. It then gets passed across, uh, passed across to something like a clearinghouse. So if, again, if there are any of you are familiar with sending money overseas, you may have had to use something called a SWIFT code. So basically when you're using this, it'll route it through SWIFT, who act as sort of an intermediary between all of these different financial institutions. So then it'll then reconcile that on, on their ledger, passed along to Bob's bank, where it's reconciled on their ledger. Now, as you would imagine, this process is incredibly expensive uh, because it requires, a, these constant reconciliation efforts require a lot of resources. So not only is it time consuming, but it also ends up being quite expensive. So not only do you have those sort of three to five day waiting periods, but to add insult to self injury and really rub salt into the wound, sometimes the bank will sort of slap you with quite a hefty uh, transaction fee. Uh, and this is really just because it's also a great expense on their end. So they're sort of passing along the burden, I suppose you could say. Um, but then most worrying of, of all is the, is the fact that 
when we trust intermediaries with our with our funds, we're really making them incredibly vulnerable because you the funds your funds are really only as secure as the intermediaries in which you entrust them with. You're sort of trusting that that intermediary isn't going to mismanage your funds. Um, you're trusting that they have networks secure enough to secure your funds. But, and as you can probably tell uh, where, with the origins of Bitcoin, um, another issue is you're also trusting that that financial uh, institution or that intermediary is going to be remain solvent uh, throughout the duration that your funds are under their management. Okay, so if we move along to the next slide. So what made Bitcoin unique? Well, it was sort of one thing in particular. As you can see there, it was the fact that it was able to disintermediate things. So instead of relying on one or several of those third party intermediaries, Bitcoin uses a type of computer algorithm in order to validate the transactions, reconcile balances, but it also enforces certain rules on the network. Now, another feature that makes Bitcoin particularly unique is the fact that it's what we call distributed. Now, if any of you are familiar with uh, technologies like BitTorrent, uh, they're forms of peer-to-peer, -peer, um, uh, they use peer-to-peer -peer network structures. So in a network like uh, BitTorrent, instead of, if it's a file sharing uh, um, net network for those of you who aren't familiar. So if, if, you, if you wanted to download a file, instead of downloading it from one central server like we usually would, you'd be connected to a series of other people who are sort of around you and connected and sharing that file, and you download it directly from them. So the benefit here is that, let's say you've got a thousand people who are sharing, have, have this file and are willing to share it. If 10 of them, they're, if 10 of them uh, were to shut off their computers or perhaps uh, they had a, a, um, a circuit go out in the house and the computer was shut down, you'd still have at least another 990 up if there were a thousand people seeding it or sharing the file. Now, in the case of the Bitcoin network, every single computer that's connected to the, to the network holds a complete copy of that ledger. Uh, and they're constantly monitoring and listening to the network and running that algorithm uh, in order to see if any new transactions are coming in so that they can add them to the ledger. Now there are a few other features that make Bitcoin particularly unique. Some of these, one of these is, is what we call mining. So if you are familiar with Bitcoin or you have heard of it, you may know what, sort of have a rough idea of what mining is. But what mining essentially is, is, is it's the process in which new, co new Bitcoins, so new digital currency, gets minted and released into the market. So that's where it gets its name from. But really what it is, is, is it's a bunch of, it's a collection of computers that are connected to the network that have decided to use some of their computing power in order to compete against one another to try and, uh, try and solve a mathematical uh, problem that would grant them, if, well, if successful, would unlock the next what we call block. All a block is is really sort of a, a grouping of transactions. So it's transactions that can come in at a certain point in time, get grouped together and encrypted. So in the case of the Bitcoin network, we have an inbuilt inflation rate. And that's enforced by that cryptographic algorithm that I, talk, I, that I spoke about before. So what happens is, on average, a new block or a new set, set of group transactions gets added to the blockchain roughly every 10 minutes. Now, how this is enforced 
is that algorithm that I spoke about, what it does is it, it will it'll take a look at, it, it, periodically, it'll take a look at the entire network, and it'll judge how much, how much computing power is being used in order to try and compete to solve that, that problem. And this is by all the computers on the network. And then what it'll do is it'll adjust the difficulty of that problem that they're all competing to solve so that, on average, every 10 minutes, someone's able to solve it and a new set of transactions is posted onto the ledger. And then in exchange for having uh, solved that puzzle, they're rewarded with newly minted Bitcoins. Now, where it gets even more interesting is that the protocol is set up so that roughly every four years, so it's a certain, so it's actually measured in blocks, but roughly every four years, that reward will halve. So this year it is um, 12.5 Bitcoins per block. And in about three years from now, uh, or two and a half now, it uh, will halve down. And then it will keep, that'll keep going on until we finally reach a limit. So Bitcoin isn't infinite. There are, is actually a, a finite amount of them. There will only ever be 21 Bitcoins um, minted. So this block reward will continue to half until we finally reach that cap of 21 million Bitcoins, which at the moment is estimated to be uh, around the year 2140. So it's not, not for quite a while. So why is Bitcoin important? Well, to be honest with you, for most of you, it probably isn't. And here's where we come to sort of one of our first major developments in blockchain technology. So why is Bitcoin relevant? Now, in true Diddy less style, I'm going to sort of try and uh, bust a bit of a myth here. So one common misconception is that Bitcoin, or actually blockchain, is Bitcoin. They're one and the same. It's actually not true. Um, so, around 2012-2013, uh, Bitcoin started to rise in price quite dramatically. So, in 2009, you could purchase a whole Bitcoin for a fraction of a cent. But then in 2013, they were trading at about 1,200 US dollars. Now, as you can imagine, sort of a media frenzy started to ensue and an increasing number of people started to take interest in the technology. But what happened here is a lot of people started to, to realize that, hey, actually, the, it's not so much Bitcoin that's interesting. It's really the technology that underlies Bitcoin. And it's that technology that we now call blockchain. But you'd be surprised by how many people today still sort of use the two interchangeably. But in actual fact, Bitcoin is a type of blockchain. So what is a blockchain then? Well, in its sort of most basic form, a blockchain is really just a type of digital ledger. Um, it's a type of digital ledger where, that derives its name from, it sort of has a unique way in which it stores um, records and links them together. So what happens is, I mentioned the process of, uh, well, I sort of mentioned uh, what a block is. It's when a set of section, uh, transactions come in within a given time uh, period. They get grouped together uh, and then encrypted. And then what will happen is we'll include a cryptographic link between each one of those blocks right back to the very first set of transactions. And that enables us to instantly reconcile that entire ledger. So what are some of the common features of a blockchain? Well, immutability is sort of one of the, the core features. Uh, so once on a blockchain, records are permanent and can't be altered. It's distributed. So a complete copy of the ledger is stored on many computers across the network and sort of just uh, under the control of one single individual or organization. It's cryptographically secure. 
So it uses advanced cryptography, not only to ensure that data is kept private, but it's also used to ensure the data's integrity. And I'll get a little bit more into that later on. And then perhaps most importantly, it's self-validating. So if we go back to that algorithm that I spoke about, a blockchain uses a blockchain instead of trusting a third party intermediary, we're instead essentially trusting in mathematics. So we're we're trusting that algorithm that we're all able to see, by the way. Um, we're trusting that algorithm to reconcile all the records, uh, but also provide rules on, on which transactions are valid, which block to follow, and so forth. Just move that out of the way there. Okay. <clears throat> now here's our second myth that we're going to bust. Now, a lot of people not only feel, not only fall into the trap of thinking that blockchain and Bitcoin are one and the same, but they quite frequently sort of mistake blockchain for being digital currencies, or as we call them today, cryptocurrencies. But in actual fact, blockchains are quite diverse, not only in the way that they're structured um, and put together in the components, but also in their intended use cases, so the problems that they're trying to solve. So how is a, so how is a blockchain typically useful? Well, the easiest way to say it, and you've probably, if you are familiar with blockchain technology, you may have seen this phrase uh, around before. It's used quite a bit. And they sort of describe bit, uh, blockchain story as being the internet of value. Now, the reason why they say that is you can kind of compare it to the internet in that they refer to the internet as the internet of information because it made um, creating and transmitting data directly with one another incredibly easy. So blockchain sort of done the same thing for assigning and transferring digital ownership of things. And so it allows us to do that without having to know or even trust each other. So for example, if you look in the middle there at the diagram, that's what we call, that's that distributed network. So that would sort of, if you were to envision what a peer-to-peer -peer network would look like, each one of those dots would represent a computer interacting with directly with one another. Now you can see here some of these computers, their valuables are, you've got uh, currency here in the middle. You've got intellectual property here on the sides. And here you even have physical property. Uh, although that would, of course, be more in the form of something like a house deed. There is actually an Australian startup um, uh, that that uh, is putting movie scripts onto a blockchain in order to try and fight um, pri uh, piracy. And uh, my understanding is they're doing doing fairly well. So another myth to sort of bust here and something to take note is you might, if seeing as blockchain is quite a, a hype technology, you might encounter some people who sort of frame it as, as if it's some sort of solution to all, all, all problems. But it really isn't. Blockchain isn't a be all and end all solution. There are actually quite a few uh, scenarios in which uh, a, a regular database is perfectly suitable. Uh, and typically these, these scenarios are anywhere where you only, you're the only individual who has to access a particular database. So if you, a blockchain really becomes useful if A, if A, of course you have to uh, assign or transfer that digital ownership, or B, if you have several different um, individuals or organizations that need to access the same ledger, but perhaps not for the same reasons. So what are some of its use cases then? Well, some of the things that it's being used for at the moment are cross-border payments. So you've got the immutability, you've got the highly secure network, uh, it's easily auditable, 
and its self-validating nature, which enables us to therefore eat instantly reconcile all those balances. So there is a company called Ripple that is doing quite well in this area. Uh, and my understanding is they are uh, planning to do a quite a large scale commercial rollout uh, later this year. Medical records is another big one. So entering things like medical records onto a blockchain, you can keep them incredibly secure. Uh, you can ensure the integrity of the data. Uh, you can keep them private because now how we do that is uh, anyone uh, using a blockchain will have uh, what we call keys. So they'll have two keys. One of them is a private key. And so that one you'll keep with yourself and you use that in order to sign transactions to verify that you're the one who submitted a record to, to the blockchain or to the ledger. The other one is your public key. And you can think of this sort of like an account number or an address. And so that's sort of more to direct who you want to send the funds to. Then you can also assign, using these public and private keys, you can also assign who can decipher uh, the records that you submit to the blockchain. So if you think about this in the context of medical records, it sort of enables us to then uh, potentially have global access to our medical records. So for example, let's say I was planning to go on a holiday to, to New York. Um, or perhaps I'm even deciding to move there. I could get in contact with, uh, or actually I may not even need to. On this network, on if we're using a particular network, you might have a collection of hospitals that are all utilizing the network, and you can grant access using your public and private keys to, to certain uh, hospitals that perhaps are affiliated with the, the network in some way or pre-screened, uh, or, uh, or you could probably decide to give the keys directly to uh, a specific doctor if you, uh, or medical professional if you uh, so chose to. Another thing is smart contracts. This may be another topic that you've come across. Uh, now, it's, it's a little bit of a confusing one. Uh, because and I think it's because of the word contract. So you may see the phrase code is law thrown around a lot. But in reality, a smart contract isn't a legal contract at all. It's just a piece of code uh, that's it's really just a set of instructions that you assign to, I guess, money, right? So, and then these instructions then get placed onto a blockchain. So you then have a set of instructions that can't be altered, that self-execute, that can't be shut down by anyone other than yourself, uh, and it's interacting at, if, if you or another party are interacting with that contract, you don't need to trust the, the, the individual that you're, you're interacting with. The reason there is because once you submit a contract to the blockchain, um, you're able to see the contents, typically able to see the contents of that uh, contract. So some of the things that we can use smart contracts for um, are things like a will. Uh, you could also, I've seen people using it for escrow, but uh, more recently I saw quite an interesting uh, use of it where um, what someone had done is, is they had a smart contract set up on their account. Now typically with digital currencies, if you lose that private key that I spoke about, it's, it can be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to recover your coins. So what someone, I've seen a few people do, is they'll set up a smart contract on a particular account whereby if they fail to submit a, a minute transaction to that contract, um, once every, let's say, week, then after a week elapses, if no, con if no transaction has been made to that contract, it'll automatically send the entire balance of that account 
to a specified address. So this is a good way to get around uh, the issue of, of, of losing the pass, passcodes uh, to, to your various uh, cryptocurrency accounts. Another, another big use case is supply chain management. So it allows for greater efficiency, particularly if you, if you uh, are utilizing those smart contracts to automate some of the processes. It can lead to a re reduction in fraud, uh, drastically reduce costs, uh, not only from the efficiencies, but also uh, from the actual costs of the documents themselves. So there are quite a few companies that are putting things like your bills of lading onto a blockchain. And the bill of lading is sort of like a record of, of everything that goes onto a, a particular shipping container. And it's uh, particularly useful for obtaining things like trade financing. Now, this can also uh, lead to improved inventory management. And so all of things, these things together enable us to sort of access a global supply chain. Okay, so where are we now? Well, we've sort of reached, started to reach a stage uh, where a lot of the hype around blockchain is actually from an enterprise level. So in the last sort of 48 months, um, what we've really started to see is several of the world's leading organizations, uh, a handful of large governments, and practically every financial institution on the planet starting to experiment with the technology, or at the very least, um, have plans to in the near future. And then what we're starting to see form are blockchain consortia. So typically, as I mentioned uh, uh, previously, uh, blockchains can be quite diverse in the way that they're structured. So a blockchain like Bitcoin is what we call both public in that anyone is able to use it, access the network. It's also permissionless in that anyone's able to post a transaction to the network and serve as uh, one of those validating nodes. So anyone can set up one of those computers that competes to solve that um, mathematical uh, puzzle in order to mint new Bitcoins. However, for enterprise usage, what we typically see is what we call a private or permissioned blockchain. So what started to gain uh, quite a bit of popularity are actually Blockchains that are typically public in nature, but permissioned in who can act as a validator or who can run the algorithm that validates those transactions. So that permission may only be granted to a select few parties. Okay, so how does a blockchain actually work? Well, let's take Alice and Bob again. And let's say we're looking at a blockchain that, that is using is acting as a form of digital currency. And Alice wishes to send transact with Bob once again. So what happens is Alice will broadcast her transaction out to the network. And the, the network, again, it'll be those uh, computers that are running that um, algorithm, and it's that algorithm that we call a consensus algorithm. Now, each of these nodes, uh, sorry, each of these computers running this algorithm are what we call nodes. And yeah, again, that, consensus, that uh, computer algorithm is called the consensus algorithm. Now, this is probably the most crucial element of any blockchain. So the consensus algorithm is essentially what confirms uh, which trend it, it confirms which transactions are valid, um, and then it also begins sorting them into blocks. Okay, so what's a block then? You can almost think of a block as sort of like a fingerprint of, of records on a blockchain. 
Um, now, this isn't sort of a, a, a technical explanation, and uh, if we went into a little bit more detail, you'd find that there actually there actually is quite a bit more to it. Um, but that's sort of the most basic explanation that you could possibly give. So a block is produced by grouping sets of transactions together um, and then running them through what we call a cryptographic hash function. And that produces what an output that we call a hash. And that hash, if you run any string of data through a, a, a hashing function, the out, it'll give you an output output that's of a specific size or, or specific length. So for example, in this case, we're using what's called the SHA-256 uh, hash function. Now what that stands for is SHA, which stands for Secure Hashing Algorithm, and the 256 just signifies that it's 256 bits in length. Um, now, SHA-256 is actually also what Bitcoin happens to use in quite a few other blockchains, uh, and was originally developed by the NSA. So the reason why we say a hash is similar to a fingerprint is that any set of data that's input into a hashing function is only, could only have one possible corresponding hash. Now, if you change that input even slightly, the corresponding hash is going to differ significantly. So let's take, for example, the three inputs we, that we have on the left of the diagram. So we have blockchain written three times. So it's essentially the same string of text, only each time, in each instance, we've changed it slightly. So in the first one, the B is capitalized. In the second one, the second letter is capitalized. And in the third input, the third letter is capitalized. So as we run them through the hashing function, we have the outputs here. And as you can see, even with that slight difference, uh, slight change, each hash differs quite significantly. Now, no matter how many times you run uh, each of those inputs through that hash function, you're going to get the same output. So the thing is, going backwards is actually quite difficult. So if you didn't know the input, it would be incredibly difficult for you to, do, to figure out what the input was from that hash unless, let's say, it, it, there happened to be a database that had the input and, and the corresponding output. Now, so if you look at this in the context of blocks, what happens is the transactions will come in, we'll take a hash of, we'll run those transactions through the cryptographic hash function. So we're, what comes out of it is that digital uh, fingerprint. Then what we start to do is we start to combine each of those ha hashes. And if you think of uh, a tennis tournament, for example, where you have sort of those tennis trees, where you have two people that square off against each other, and that keeps going on until you're left with one final match, it's sort of, it's just, we follow the same premise when we come to building blocks on a blockchain, in that we continuously combine uh, hashes and then run them through a hashing algorithm until we're left with one final hash, which we call the root hash. And then you typically that'll be combined with a few other things and hashed once again, and then that's what forms a block. So the technology gets its name from the fact that each one of these blocks of group transactions has a cryptographic link to the past. So how we do this is, is you take that um, uh, root hash that I just spoke about, and then you include uh, what's called the block header of the previous block. Now, the block header is just the root hash, the previous block header in combination with whatever other uh, uh, data that, that happens to go into that particular blockchain's blocks. So typically, this might be something like a timestamp to add some variability, uh, and even something called a nonce, which um, adds a little bit more variability to the hash, 
but in the context of the Bitcoin blockchain, it's that notch that allows us to fluctuate the difficulty of that mathematical problem that people are trying to solve. So anyways, this cryptographic link enables us to create a chain of linked groupings of transactions, and it's this chain that we call the blockchain. Now, any attempt to go back a few blocks and and change a transaction is, of course, going to break that cryptographic link. Because let's say we try to go back two blocks here, and we try to alter a transaction uh, in this block here in the middle. Well, what would happen is it would change that entire tree structure that we spoke about, because the hash of that particular transaction would change significantly. Therefore, so would the entire block's hash, and it would therefore no longer be able to be linked to the one that succeeded it. So what would happen is all of those nodes that, that are running that consensus algorithm and constantly monitoring the, le uh, the ledger and looking for new transactions, um, the algorithm would just instantly regret, uh, instantly reject uh, that fraudulent transaction. And as a result, the entire network would just ignore it and keep going uh, forward. Uh, typically, uh, a blockchain uh, consensus algorithm, we will, will enforce that the network, the, the valid chain is the one that is the longest chain. Now, every now and then, it, it may be due to things like latency that uh, um, two particular blocks are added at the same time. So we have, we end up with two, two blockchains of the same length. What happens here is it'll just keep continuing on until one of them is longer than the other, and that's the one that will follow. Okay, so are we there yet? So if you've been following these little diagrams here on the right, you may have noticed that we never reached that final mountain. Now the reason why is because, well, we're really at this stage here, this, this, fourth, mount, this fourth little hill over here. And that's because, look, we're starting to get a lot of interest and a lot of enterprise and a lot of government and uh, large uh, organizations are starting to get involved and starting to, to build some, some large-scale projects. But we're still really yet to see a lot of these major projects come out of the testing phase and come into actual, get ready for actual commercial rollout. So I'll sort of reserve that last hill for when we finally see a little bit more of that um, um, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, blockchains that are in, currently in the testing phase come out of development. Thank you, Joshua, for this wonderful session. I found it very interesting and informative. So, everyone, with regards to the next steps, DDLS will be organizing a series of blockchain webinars later in the year. Should you wish to explore the technology further or be informed on the next availability, please email us at training at ddls.com.au or contact an account manager on 1-800-853-276. Okay, we will now go through the audience's questions. I can see that we've had quite a few questions during the course of the webinar, so we will now go through them individually. If you have any other questions that you've just thought of, please type them into the Q&A panel and we will add them to the list to be addressed accordingly. So, question number one for you, Joshua. No technology is perfect. So, what are the current limitations of blockchain technology? Yeah, okay, good question. <clears throat> so, this is actually the reason why we sort of haven't really managed to reach that, that last step, in that for all of its benefits, uh, one, one problem that virtually every blockchain tends to face is what we call it scalability. So they typically run into scaling issues, um, particularly uh, th those public blockchains like Bitcoin. Uh, they're not really able to handle very many transactions per second. And um, from memory, the Bitcoin blockchain is only able to, ha to handle about three transactions per second. 
Um, and if you contrast that to something like Visa, uh, my understanding is Visa is typically doing about uh, 1,300 transactions per second, but have capability to do significantly more. So that's sort of one of the primary limitations at the moment. Um, now, there are a lot of great solutions that are being worked on in that space, and not all blockchains do face this issue. So a few are far better at scaling than others. But then, now, whether they're able to, to, to handle more transactions per second uh, or not, it, one issue that they all tend to face is that because because each one of those computers that's connected to the network is holding that complete copy of all transactions, you can imagine as time goes on, that starts to sort of take up quite a bit of space. Uh, so for for example, the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, that entire file, I think, is around 130 gigabytes. Um, for a, an, another popular public blockchain called Ethereum, that file is about 70 gigabytes. And then keep in mind that these technologies really aren't that old. I mean, Bitcoin's only been around since about 2009, uh, and Ethereum only since 2004. So going forward, you can sort of start to see how this may be an issue. Um, particularly if you want to encourage more nodes to be participating in the network, because the more nodes watching the network, sort of the more secure it becomes. So yeah, uh, scaling is, is one of the major issues. Um, and then depending on how the blockchain is structured, you may also sometimes run, run into uh, regulatory issues. Are there any other questions? Thanks, Josh. Uh, next question is, how far away are we from seeing many of the enterprise level use cases you mentioned from transitioning from the more conceptual testing phase to actual commercial rollout? Yeah, okay, good question. Um, it really depends on the use case. Uh, at the moment, we typically tend to see the fine, the the projects that are tackling um, use cases within the financial services in, financial services industry tend to be a little bit further along uh, than others. Now, I'm not sure if that's due to the, the the amount of resources. Perhaps it's due to the fact that. Um, financial services related use cases have sort of been around slightly longer. Um, but I think we're going to start to see a lot of these come out of development within the next three years. So I think that's quite um, a really not too far off. Um, however, for a lot of, you know, for, for things particularly like medical records, uh, while it is a significant use case and does have a lot of potential, it, there are obviously quite justified concerns, and it has been facing quite a bit of pushback. So I think it might be a little bit of time before we start seeing things like uh, medical records placed onto a, a, a blockchain. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's sort of it's a spectrum. Um, I think we'll start to see some in the next three years, but uh, probably the majority are more about five or so years off. Now, we had another question come in from Prashant. Um, uh, so, sorry, Josh, before we go there, uh, I have a question from Peter Sutt. His question is, for Bitcoin, who decides the rules and if or when to make changes to the rules? For example, increase the reward for mining or increase the number of bitcoins? Is there a group that to agrees to these rules? Or? Yeah, so there's no, there's no, there's no specified um, or centralized group. So it's, it's the network that essentially decides on it. Um, now, to my knowledge, I, I don't think that, that that block reward can be changed, and I don't think that you can increase the limit uh, to the amount of bitcoins that can be minted. Um, or at least, if you could, it would have to be done through um, 
through a, a, a hot, what we call a hard fork, and that's essentially where you fork the change in two, with one being uh, the chain with sort of the, that old set of attributes, and then the new one would follow whatever proposed upgrade is. But when you do that, you're essentially creating another cryptocurrency if the network doesn't agree uh, to follow that particular uh, pathway, right? So, uh, or at least if the majority of the network doesn't uh, agree to follow that particular fork. So let's say we had someone who proposed, who wanted to change, increase the uh, capacity of Bitcoin from 21 million to 30 million. What would happen is they'd have to put out a proposal. Um, and then how that would work is those, those computers that are acting as nodes and um, um, Acting as the miners, sorry, the the ones that are that are competing to to, to solve that um, that mathematical problem and lending their computing power to the network, they would vote by directing their um, computing power towards uh, the chain that they agree with. So if you look at that fork, they'd either vote for this one or they'd vote for this one. Um, so the only real way to do something like that would be to have um, a, lot, a majority of the total computing power on that network. Um, now, in the case of Bitcoin, that's incredibly expensive to do, uh, seeing as the total computing power on the Bitcoin network, uh, I believe, is more than Google and Amazon combined, last I heard. So it would, the cost would be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. No, oh, that's sure interesting. That was, uh, yep. Not sure if that was clear. Yep, no, that's clear to me. Uh, I have a question from Brendan Osman. He would like to know what your thoughts on SigWit are. Um, um, well, so for those, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, SegWit stands for Segregated Witness, um, and it's a proposed upgrade uh, to Im Im improve on the, the, the scaling issues that I mentioned before. So, in the, so the Bitcoin network is actually experiencing a bit of a problem at the moment uh, in that each block uh, has a limit and can only be one megabyte in size. Now, the issue is that because Bitcoin's been um, uh, gaining probably more popularity than its creator had anticipated, um, what we're finding is that while bl new blocks are, while blocks aren't meant to fill up within those 10 minute windows, we're finding that they're starting to fill up well before them. So segregated witness uh, is a form of increasing that uh, a protocol upgrade that will increase that block size. Um, and it also paves the way for something called the Lightning Network that enable, it would enable Bitcoin to, um, to handle hundreds of thousands of transactions per, per second. Um, my personal thoughts on SegWit uh, is uh, I'm not opposed to it. Um, I've been a, a strong supporter of both the Monero um, blockchain as well as the Litecoin blockchain uh, and the Decred project, all three of which activated SegWit uh, quite some time ago, uh, Monero well over a year ago, um, and so far without issue. Um, and it look in my personal view, it's just it's um, scaling is sort of the 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 number one issue that we're all facing at the moment. So, um, and Segwit is is Segwit and Lightning Network are um, uh, one of the the oldest and most um, scrutinized uh, solutions to those. So I think we're probably unlikely to find um, any solutions that, that's as tested in the short term. 
Thanks for that, Josh. I got a question from Claire Dunkley. Uh, do you have a view on the different types of blockchain, for example, Ethereum versus Hyperledger versus Bitcoin? And is there room for many depending on purpose, or will one of them emerge as a preferred protocol? Um, so it's, look, you can never really predict the future, but uh, look, in my personal view, um, I think it's, um, I don't see there being one be all end all blockchain. Um, you know, quite often you sort of say, you know, you'll hear people say what's better, Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, now, the problem there is you're sort of comparing apples to oranges. Um, you know, while they both are blockchains and while they both do have um, sort of cryptocurrencies attached to them, they're not really direct competitors. Um, so for those of you not familiar with Ethereum, Ethereum is another type of blockchain that enables us to submit smart contracts to the blockchain that, that are capable of sort of acting as the brains for decentralized applications. Now, Ethereum has its own inbuilt currency, which they call Ether. But the difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin is that in Bitcoin, where the coin is used sort of really as a currency to, to send back and forth between one another, Ethereum's currency is used more like oil oil is, in that you Ether is, is what's required in order to pay for the computations on the, net, on the network. So when you set up one of these smart contracts, um, depending on what you want the contract to do, each one of those individual computations, depending on how much power it requires, is going to have a, a certain cost, albeit a very small one, that's paid in Ether. Uh, and then you have blockchains like Hyperledger, which um, are really sort of tackling more enterprise usage. Um, the Hyperledger project doesn't have its own inbuilt uh, currency. I mean, I think, look, uh, there are definitely areas in which they're either overlapping or competing. Um, but for the most part, I think there's, there's no reason why they can't uh, coexist. Um, and it really depends on, on, on what you intend to do with the, the, the currency and, um, uh, or at least, sorry, not the currency, what, what you intend to do with the blockchain. Um, if you're looking to do something like, I don't know, uh, trade finance, then, you know, it wouldn't really make too much sense to be using the Bitcoin blockchain, you may use the Ethereum blockchain, but you're probably going to gravitate towards um, something like the Hyperledger project. Sounds good. Uh, i got a question from Sam. Is it, is it possible at all to still be able to steal digital currencies if they are fully secured by blockchain? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So. Actually, I should have mentioned that this is none of, uh, another one of the sort of the, the key limitations to te the technology. Um, in that, if we go back to those public and private keys that I spoke about before, um, if you lose that, you you really need to keep that private key safe because you need that, that in order to access uh, your cryptocurrency and sign transactions. So you need that private key in order to be able to make transactions. Um, so uh, the issue there is if you happen to lose that key and someone gains access to it, uh, either by, I don't know, stumbling upon your uh, carelessly unencrypted hard drive or perhaps someone's installed a keylogger on your computer and they're able to, to um, log your keystrokes and uh, pick up your recovery phrase, yeah, they can absolutely um, gain access to your uh, private key and, and sign a transaction and uh, send those cryptocurrencies to yourself, um, or to themselves, sorry. And uh, one of the big issues with cryptocurrency is because it's decentralized by nature, with a lot of them, if you lose those coins, you're very unlikely to get them back. Um, 
I think there are a handful of projects um, that have permissioned consensus algorithms that may allow you to sort of reverse transactions, but generally you're not able to do so. So yeah, no, that absolutely is a, a big problem. Um, and that's that's where building what we call wallet software is critical for the further adoption of cryptocurrencies. So a wallet software is just a, a piece of software which secures your keys and also your coins and allows you to make transactions. Um, now improvements are being made in this area sort of uh, through introducing two-factor or even multi-factor authentication. Um, so in order to, to make a certain transaction, you may need to get uh, one or two other individuals to sign off on it. Another question from Matt Vermeer. In Bitcoin, a proof of work occurs as multiple nodes accept a transaction as valid, also known as a POW. How does a bank or insurance company, blockchain for example, verify that it is correct without multiple nodes running a copy of the chain? Um, so in the case of Bitcoin, um, it's so the proof of work uh, doesn't occur so much once they verify those transactions. It's once they actually verify that they've found the hash that corresponds to the upcoming uh, block of transactions. Um, so, you know, like I, I, I mentioned before, if you're going through that uh, SHA-256 uh, hashing algorithm, um, and then you add in the nonce, uh, it'll take on average 10 minutes to 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 solve that uh, puzzle. Now, if you were to have one computer, um, the SHA-256 is really, the, there are two to the power of 256 uh, different possibilities, uh, which is a, an incredibly large number. Um, but due to the sheer amount of total computing power on the network, uh, you have all these uh, uh, computers that are just constantly running these hashes in order to try and find the next one. So that's what the proof of work is. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you uh, meant to say, sorry. But that, um, so the, the question was in, in the context of something like insurance, how could they do that without having to rely on those nodes, um, wait for those nodes to, to, to validate the transactions or show the proof of work? Is, is I'm assuming that that's uh, um, what, you, what you meant. Um, so the thing is, they, they may not require a proof of work consensus mechanism. Um, the proof of work consensus mechanism was really implemented in Bitcoin because it was fully public and permissionless. Um, so because we didn't have any way of knowing who these different nodes that were validating these transactions were, we sort of had to in, uh, had to introduce. Well, sorry, Bitcoin. The creators of Bitcoin had to introduce. Uh, some sort of mechanism that would associate some sort of cost towards trying to attack um, uh, the network. Now, in the case of something like insurance, the chances are you're probably going to be using a private or permission blockchain, in which case those validator nodes um, the, or the ability to be one of those nodes that validates the transactions probably isn't going to be open to the general public. Um, and instead, it's typically going to be um, a role that's given to a select few uh, pre-screened uh, and known validators. Uh, so let's say you have a consortium. Um, something like Ripple's consortium, for example, consists of not only financial institutions, um, but also leading uh, educational institutions like MIT serve as one of the nodes for Ripple. And then instead of instead of using proof of work to validate those, uh, to, to compete, to solve the next block, what they do is they have a, what we call a, a um, bonded proof of stake consensus uh, mechanism. And so the cost of them then is, is instead not their computing power, 
but they actually have to put up a bond um, of the digital currency. And then, of course, you could sort of say that they're also putting up a reputational bond in that if they do try to act against the network, of course, they'll lose the rights to act, to participate in it. Um, now, going down this route um, enables us to sort of uh, avoid a lot of the latency issues that we typically face with something like a, a, a fully public blockchain. So it enables you to process those transactions a lot quicker um, and uh, a lot cheaper as well. Uh, so, for example, with Bitcoin, um, in order to incentivize miners to pick up your uh, transactions, you'll often need to include a fee. Well, you always need to include a fee, but if you want to expedite the process, you might have to pay quite a hefty fee, fee uh, at times. So by taking out those miners, taking them out of the equation, you sort of get rid of a lot of that. I'm not sure if that answered your question, sorry. Oh, that's fine, Josh. Uh, we've got a question from Prashant. Bitcoins are the currency of choice as used by ransomware attacks. Well, what steps can we take to make sure that this is secure? Um, oh, look, there just, there is, there's no way to stop cryptocurrencies from being used um, in ransomware attacks, um, particularly since we're starting to see more and more privacy-focused digital currencies starting to emerge. Um, but one thing to note is that I've noticed that for a lot of these uh, ransomware attacks, um, they're actually spoofs. Um, so if you do find yourself falling victim to one of these attacks, one thing that you want to go and do is look up and see whether, uh, you know, if it happens to be a common attack and other people have experienced it, go and look at, uh, for those of you who aren't aware of what a ransomware attack is, what will happen is, um, you know, uh, the, the virus will get access to your computer and it'll lock up all your files and a, a screen will flash up and I'll say something like send one Bitcoin to this address or all of your files will be locked and it'll give you a time limit. Now what I've typically, started, uh, typically noticed is that if you go and look up a, a lot of these ransomware attacks, the address that's listed um, on that pop-up screen tends to be the same. Uh, so the thing there is that if I were to go and send a, a, a Bitcoin or send the, the ransom to that address, there's no real way of them knowing that it came from me. So there's no way of them actually determining whether or not I've paid. So I sort of then put into question whether or not uh, the ransomware is actually genuine. Um, now, in scenarios where uh, the ransomware is in fact genuine, yeah, unfortunately, there isn't a great deal that you can do uh, to get around it. Of course, uh, the best defense, um, you know, is always uh, taking preventative measures beforehand. Um, so you just, you know, you really want to make sure that you're you're using, um, you, you have some solid antivirus uh, software installed, um, you're not clicking on any uh, dodgy links, you're, you're keeping all your drivers and your, your operating system up to date and uh, so forth. But yeah, there's, there's just no real way to stop cryptocurrencies from, from being used um, in ransomware attacks. It's um, an unfortunate, uh, um, an unfortunate uh, side effect of the technology. So, for, for all the good that they bring, of course, it does come with a few bad things. No worries. And uh, last question for the day from Jim. What happens to blocks that aren't accepted who are also written permanently to the chain? Yeah, okay. So the only blocks that get permanently written to the chain are the ones that have been accepted by the network. So it's the, so the only ones that will get accepted and officially posted to the blockchain. Um, are the ones that have just happened to come in first. Um, so we always follow the longest chain. Um, and then what happens is 
let's say the blockchain is going along, a new block is added. Now, every subsequent block after that is what's called a confirmation. And the more confirmations that we have, the further down the, that particular block is in the chain. So that sort of uh, each each additional confirmation uh, means that it sort of has a, you have greater sure, surety that 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 block is permanent. Um, however, anything that isn't accepted by the network as being the first um, the first block to come in. Uh, just has to wait until the next round. It isn't added. Um, isn't added as a permanent record um, as yet. Yeah.